Welcome to the stage, Dr. Mario Heidrich. Thank you very much. Is this, this is on, yeah. This is good. Welcome, everybody, to uh, my talk about my personal and abusive relationship with AngularJS. Who here in the audience knows what AngularJS is? That's almost everybody. It's impressive. Good. Um, my name is Mario, and I have a company in Berlin. We do penetration tests. I am a, a researcher and postdoc for the Ruhr University in Bochum. Wrote some books, wrote some papers, published some tools, and I tweet then and when. And if you have any questions during or after the talk, you're very free to drop me an email and uh, just ask away. What we're going to talk about today is AngularJS and how it deals with security. And uh, we want to go deep, we want to go technical on this, because we want to find out how does it work in the core and how much attack surface is actually being ex exposed by websites using AngularJS. How does that affect us as penetration testers and secure developers? And how much attack surface does the project itself expose? So one of the more important questions during this talk that we're trying to answer, whether AngularJS is the honey boo boo of JavaScript frameworks. Who here knows honey boo boo? That's surprisingly small amount of people, so I'm not sure if my narrative is going to work. Um, you should definitely Google that, because it's important knowledge. I encourage you to have a look at that. So first of all, what is AngularJS? I think most of you already know it is a farther, rather popular JavaScript model view controller framework. Actually, it's a model view whatever framework, as they call it themselves, the developers call it themselves, because you can kind of shape it into something that just fits your needs and doesn't have to necessarily be a controller. So it more or less outsources a lot of logic that web applications used to have been doing on the server into the client, into the browser itself or whatever instance is running there that behaves like a browser. The AngularJS developers proclaim their own framework to be super heroic, which of course I hope is irony, and uh, it's co-maintained and recommended by Google. So if you look at tutorials, for example, how to create packaged apps and advanced websites, they do recommend AngularJS. So everybody uses it. It has a fairly polarizing philosophy because it kind of throws away a lot of things that we used to think about web applications. So it throws away the usual pattern of requesting something and then getting the response, working with the response, requesting something again, getting a response. It does things differently. You won't find get parameters in AngularJS web applications, at least not commonly, if you do follow the philosophy. And it has an ever-growing user base. More and more people are actually using it, and the rate of adoption is enormous. So if you have later access to those slides, you can click those amazing links, and you will see graphs that go upwards that indicates more and more people are using it. And if you have a look at the GitHub repository of AngularJS, everything is open out there, you will see that the traffic in there is insanely dense. So many pull requests, so many bugs, so many questions, so many users. So it's interesting, and it's very interesting for attackers. And we want to find out how we can abuse this as attacker, or how we can find possible abuse as penetration testers and security developers. I've been talking about AngularJS in the past, but more in a uh, rather general scope and talking about JavaScript model view controller frameworks. But AngularJS kept sticking out. It kept being the most interesting one and the weirdest one and the most polarizing one. And I had a lot of contact with the developers, including the Google security team, and that contact was not always good. Good job was done by Google security team. Not so great of a job was being done by the AngularJS developers themselves because they were kind of reluctant to accept that they actually create new attack surface by doing the framework in the way they're actually doing it. We had a bunch of strange discussions, and some of them are linked, so you can have a look at them later on, and you will realize that they're actually quite strange. But I want to make one thing sure, and I want to make sure that wailing on AngularJS tonight is nothing personal. I don't dislike the people who create it. I don't dislike Google. I don't dislike people who use it. It's just to point out what the weaknesses are so we know them, we can point at them in the projects that we're auditing and make sure that the mistakes that are being made by the framework don't happen to us. So if you have a look at Google and say, hey, Google, what do you think about AngularJS? The first thing that you're going to find is self-praise. I like it. This is like an invitation for an attacker because they say, like, we're the super heroic JavaScript model view, whatever framework. Nice. And they really like themselves, which is okay, I guess. And uh, most importantly, why they claim to be super heroic is that they say, we change the way how you should work with web applications and how you should create web applications totally. We also change the API all the time, so upgrades are made hard. 
And if you want to, for example, upgrade an AngularJS framework on your existing website to a newer version, you can expect breakage. And uh, once you have a look, for example, at the list of changes that they did that are breaking, you will find out that there is one, and this is just one of 92 in the entire change log. So 92 breaking changes. That is insane. That is a lot. They basically say, screw compatibility, we need to kind of redefine the web. We need to redefine how applications work, how browsers work with HTML, what actually, uh, HTML actually does, and how we can write simpler and more efficient web applications. So is it the honey boo boo of MVC? Is it really like one of these frameworks that thinks to be doing something smart, but then again it turns out to be something not so smart, but rather stupid and risky and dangerous? Let's see. Um, AngularJS does indeed have fairly high security standards, and they meanwhile do the, know the meaning of the word security. And they have a set of rules that they recommend to people, and say, like, okay, you have to follow these rules, and if you do so, you won't have cross-site scripting, and that's right. But if you don't follow our rules, and develop your own rules, then uh, we cannot guarantee for anything. And in addition to that, the framework itself is extremely complex. So it does so many things, and it simplifies so many things with a huge and complex backend, the JavaScript itself. And it contributes to the complexity that we have already with the web security paradox of layers, where we have too many layers that are talking to each other to actually fulfill the request of the user of just showing a website, emitting events, clicking somewhere, then getting something back that matches the events, and so on and so on. Adding complexity is not always a good thing. Adding the complexity in the client might be even worse. So what the AngularJS team is recommending to developers in their security documentation, and yes, they have a security documentation, which is great, is they essentially say, do this or you're going to be screwed. Do not mix client and server-side templates. So don't reflect content. Don't allow anyone to put something in the URL and then return that information back from the server. If you do so, you have access as guaranteed. Do not use user input to generate templates dynamically. No dynamic templates. Templates have to be static, otherwise you're screwed. Do not run user input through scope aval, otherwise you're screwed. They have a sandbox, but they also say, like, yeah, our sandbox is just like so-so. It's not really a security sandbox. We just want to get developers off the DOM because the DOM sucks. They also say consider using CSP, but don't rely only on CSP, and that is quite smart, because AngularJS is one of the few frameworks that actually harmonizes with CSP, because they don't use functionality that blocks the usage of CSP, unlike other frameworks that make tons of use of function constructor, eval, and other things that you just can't use in combination with CSP. So that is good. But we want to be attackers here, we want to be nasty, we want to have a look at the weaknesses of the framework to learn how we can get stronger when operating with that framework or against websites using that framework. Now the question is, what should we have a look at? How can we systematize the approach, make sure we really cover everything that is out there and be as thorough as possible? I was coming up with four general attack vectors. And the first one would be to have a look at the AngularJS sandbox because they have a sandbox. That means that they claim that you can take user input and put it into a machine and have it be evaluated and parsed and magically transformed, and then it does something in the browser, something logical, like loops or conditions and things like that, but you can't access the DOM, you can't access cookies or window allocation or something like that. So that might be interesting. We also want to have a look at the sanitizer because they do feature a cross-site scripting sanitizer. Basically, a directive where you can say, hey, directive, here's a string, and that string is dirty. It contains tons of dirty HTML, but I want you to clean it, and the result should not contain any risk for XSS. And they're not quite bad with that. Then we want to have a look at the CSP mode because, as mentioned, it does harmonize the CSP, but you have to activate that first. You have to tell the framework, hey, framework, I want to use CSP because I'm security aware, unlike all the others, and please make it work. And then the framework says, like, okay, I can do that. You turn that switch on. I'm going to be a bit slower now, so don't kind of be sad when people are complaining, but I'm going to be compatible with CSP, which is quite great. And then, of course, with the project with that much traction on the bug tracker and uh, the GitHub repo, we want to see if the code base itself is secure or if we can attack the developers and kind of trick them into doing something that gives us, the attackers, new bugs. So how good is their operational security? Let's have a look at A1, the sandbox. The sandbox is kind of weird because contrary to many other sandboxes, the AngularJS sandbox does not claim any more to be a security sandbox. They claimed this in the very beginning, but then they quickly learned that this is not possible in the world of JavaScript. You cannot just create something that parses strings, evaluates them as JavaScript, and does that in a safe manner. Many people tried, pretty much all of them failed. 
So meanwhile, they claim that the sandbox is actually a mechanism to isolate the DOM away so developers cannot use it. Because they say if developers start mixing our paradigms with the ones of classic DOM usage, then they're going to shoot themselves in the foot. And they're quite right about that. So they essentially say, fingers off the original DOM, don't touch the DOM, the DOM is a maze, it's a hall of mirrors, you shouldn't be there, no one should be there, DOM should not be used anymore, use our API because it's much better, testable, scalable, and so on. However, still when doing penetration tests against websites that are using AngularJS, I would say in about 60% of all cases, we see that people are using the sandbox for security purposes, or don't follow the design paradigms where they actually mix templates with user content. And if that happens, it's getting interesting. So when that happens, you might have the possibility in old versions of AngularJS to create a sandbox bypass by doing something very simple. This would be an expression that should be safe and should not allow you to give you to kind of get access to the DOM. But in the very early versions, it was possible to basically call upon the constructor of the scope object, here this, and call the constructor of the constructor which was returning the function constructor, and with the function constructor you have an eval, because you can just take a string, throw it in there, execute it, and there you are in the middle of the DOM, can do whatever you want, access document cookie. So that was it. Trivial. And uh, needless to say, we reported that, and then they fixed it. And I said, okay, um, you can't do this anymore, because now we're checking whether you're trying to use the function constructor, and if you do so, and we actually check that by having a look at the objects after parsing the expression, then we say, nope, early return, ain't get no access to the function constructor, bye-bye, nice try. So, okay, that is good. And they deployed that with version 1.2.0. Do you know any websites that are still using version 1.1.x or even earlier? Surprising, because many websites out there still use the old version. There was a bunch of data that was gathered by a friend from Norway, and he found out that the majority of websites is actually using 1.0.8. And they can never upgrade, because if they would upgrade, the changes would be breaking, they have to rewrite the code. And rewriting code sucks. Anyhow, in 1.2.0, they introduced a better sandbox. And it got harder to bypass this thing. So this thing here wouldn't work anymore, where you would just like import an older version of AngularJS, specify a diff element, where you say diff class, ng-app, your gng app no, and then just inject this particular expression, and then you have XSS. Imagine this could be a username. None of the native functions that we know on the server would ever protect against that, because there's nothing in there in terms of characters that is indicating badness. We just have a bunch of curlies and parentheses. No one filters these. So the fixes were there, and they were actually quite nice. And as mentioned, they did just by parsing. So they actually took the string apart that you had in the expression, split it into smaller pieces, compared it to existing objects, and if something came out that indicated that it might be the function constructor or anything else that is dangerous, they said, like, nope, we're opting out early, nothing's gonna happen here. But this is, of course, where the challenge starts, and where you wanna have a look as an attacker, because if they make a better sandbox, then you just have to make a better attack. And people did. A bunch of bypasses were found by uh, one gentleman from my team, Jan Horn, by Matthias Karlsson from Sweden, and by Gabo Molnar from Hungary. And they found different ways to access the function constructor. Only was that ways where the sandbox would notice that something fishy is going on. Let's have a look at these for a, week, for a quick second. This is a bypass constructed by Jan Horn, who was working against 1.2.18. We just recently used this in the pen test because they were still running that version. And it's still almost trivial because you can see the only thing that is happening here is that we take like a mapping and then we access like an empty string and every string has a sub method. So we take the sub method and we fetch its sub we, we fetch its child property call again fetch the child property call then we execute the child property call then we throw a bunch of things in that is calling get on property descriptor then it's accessing underscore underscore proto and uh, taking the descriptor value which is then in this particular situation the function constructor but it's just being returned as a value so it's no direct access then we execute the whole thing with the string as a parameter that's it the next bypass is a bit more complex um, and it kind of covers another version as well, because they fix that by simply prohibiting access to underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore, underscore. So I had to look at that and so say, like, fixing access or kind of forbidding access to underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore? Nah, that is not sufficient, because the only thing we have to do is call get prototype off. And that's it. We got proto back. Next bypass. Then this bypass is beautiful. It's from Matthias, and it's just like pure beauty, because he says, okay, we have a scope object, 
And the scope object has, of course, a two-string function, like almost every object in JavaScript. So we take the two-string function, and then we access the constructor and the prototype, and then again two-string. And we override this with two-string constructor prototype call. So that means for every other object in the scope that will ever be called at, the two-string is always call. It's like natively overwritten. So when you stringify something, you don't get stringification. You get a call, which is quite cool. Then the fine gentleman created an array with like one nonsense element in here and another element that is alert one. Then he called sort upon that array. So it's like, okay, let's sort it with a callback. And that is, of course, two string constructor, which is long overwritten with call. And then you have a call, you have an a well, you have an execution, and that's it, sandbox bypassed. Almost trivial. Then there is Gabor's bypass, which is not that trivial anymore. And uh, what he did is pretty much introducing a second generation of bypasses. We're going to see his third generation as well, but this is the second generation of sandbox bypasses in AngularJS. So you can see there's a lot going on in this scene. So he says, like, okay, I cannot do all this prototype magic anymore. I don't have access to proto anymore. They killed all the ES5 functions that were so useful. And that is really annoying. So what he did, he was having a look at what is actually available in the scope object and realized that a bunch of internal properties of AngularJS are actually present and just waiting to be overridden. And he's like, OK, so let's do that. Let's override all that stuff. And then the sandbox said, no, you can't override this, because that smells like function constructor you. And it's like, OK, then I have to be a bit more careful, a bit more subtle. And piece by piece, he went down and overwrote a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there. And in the end, he was getting the function constructor back, and he had an eval and just like fed it with a string. He's not calling for alert 1 like everybody does. He's calling for alert 42, which is much cooler. So it continued. One thing that uh, Jan and me more or less parallelly discovered was to abuse click handlers and focus handlers in AngularJS. We get access to the event object, and the event object would get us access to the view object of the event object. And what is view? That is window. Sweet. But AngularJS would say, like, oh, window, you can't use window because that's dangerous. Fingers off window, I'm going to throw an alert here. So we say, like, okay, we're not going to access window. We're just going to go deeper. We access location, then we okay, access replace, and then we feed it the JavaScript URI, and that would be working. Trivial again, but was a functioning bypass. And uh, eventually we realized that the AngularJS team was doing a better and better job in fixing their sandbox and was kind of removing more and more features that you can do with it. So developers were screaming, because like, I can't do this anymore. I was doing this for all those releases. And I was like, yeah, because security. Say thanks to those guys. Like, OK. So some restrictions they added. Other restrictions were removed again, then re-added, then removed again, and re-added again. It was quite fascinating. If you watch that particular file and have a look at the changes, you will see a lot of traction in there that is only about sandbox bypasses that were first too restrictive, then not restrictive enough, then too restrictive again, and so on. And this one is pretty insane. So that was like the last one of the generation two bypasses that I witnessed. And that was again created by Jan. He, he told me he spent the entire night working on this thing. And I do believe that. Because he was basically doing what Gabor was doing. He was just like going through the core of AngularJS and patching and modifying and overriding and dealing here a little bit here, there a little bit here, a callback, there a callback, a little bit of overriding again. Then finalizing the first expression, and then starting another expression to kind of make use of the internal stringification and bootstrapping process, and then actually deliver his payload, which arrives here at the end, and pops another alert. But you can kind of see that this is not going anywhere. This is like an arms race, and uh, they fixed that as well. It's like, OK, hmm, we can't get across these barriers anymore. Like, the sandbox is too powerful. Everything was pretty much forbidden. We didn't have access to window, neither did we have access to function or to the object or to call or apply. No document, no location, no DOM notes, nothing. Everything was killed. And it was, of course, frustrating. We couldn't even access regular expressions because even they were considered to be dangerous. But is that the end of the road? Well, not so much. This is another second generation bypass that is kind of matching together or mixing together with the first generation bypass because it both overrides existing objects in the scope object and overrides native code in JavaScript. So you can see here that Jan is creating a number by just like typing the value zero. And then he uses this weird double array index because that was not seen by the sandbox, whereas a single array index was being seen. So he had to use a nested index. Does the same thing in JavaScript. 
but does not the same thing according to AngularJS parser. Because the parser said, like, oh, no, that's cool. I don't really know JavaScript. But JavaScript said, no, that's the same as just like a single index. So that was the third bypass. Again, overwriting certain properties, this time with the array pop method. Um, here we have the payload. And then the entire thing is being thrown into root $eval, because they bring their own eval method. Because why not, right? And upon calling eval, we have a stringification. The stringification is being triggered here. The actual result is popping an array element with a callback, and the callback is defined here as a string, and then it's being thrown into the function constructor, and that's it. And it was interesting because it was the first sandbox bypass that actually made use of root eval. And it was working up unto version number 1.4.5. Now, in a recent penetration test, we ran into the latest version, 1.4.7. Meanwhile, 1.4.8 was like, OK, this one doesn't work anymore. We're absolutely far too lazy to kind of find a new AngularJS as Thankbox bypass. So what to do now? Well, luckily, someone else came up and found the third generation of AngularJS Thankbox bypasses. I don't have this thing on the slides um, because it's still not fixed. And I have the impression that the AngularJS team actually gave up and said, like, you know what? <laughs> Whatever. Have your XSS, leave us alone. I think they're pretty much just investing time into working on AngularJS 2.0 and kind of said, like, you know, 1.x branch, whatever, leave us alone, which is okay. So for penetration tests, it is extremely useful because you not only see that you have a possible interpolation, but you can also prove that you can use it for arbitrary JavaScript execution and thereby tell the developers, don't just update AngularJS, actually make it non bindable so it's safe. Please don't just update AngularJS. And that's a good thing. So one more bypass was coming from our side. Uh, it was using a little bit of user interaction. And you maybe or maybe not know that I'm a big fan of copy and paste, and that you can do amazing things with copy and paste. So this was my latest bypass, also working against the latest version, where just basically overwriting the event upon doing a copy-paste interaction internally in the browser, abusing the new copy and paste API, and filling the clipboard with something that is definitely not what you believe to copy. So I'm just like dynamically overwriting everything in the clipboard, so I have HTML in the clipboard. Well, almost HTML, it's actually SVG. Create like an SVG animation in the overwritten clipboard content, and once the user pastes something, well, that's it then. Then you have the alert. So this is kind of the end of the road with the sandbox bypasses, and I think we pretty much have depleted the entirety of the hex surface here. Learning number one for us. We now have universal sandbox bypass. They don't fix them anymore, as it seems. And whenever you run into an imp uh, expression interpolation in an AngularJS application that you're testing, you know you have an XSS, and you can upgrade as much as you want. It's not going to help you. So let's see, which is actually good, because you have to do it the right way, and updating and hoping for the best is not the right way. But there's more surface. Let's have a look at A2. A2 would be the sanitizer. So AngularJS gives us a component that is called Donna Sanitize, and as mentioned, this is supposed to feed a string, sanitize that string, throw out everything that is potentially malicious, and then allow you to safely use it in the DOM. They even use this internally when they, for example, allow you to use strings inside expressions without any treatment. You can only do that if you have sanitize on, activate it, and then everything's going to be fine. So of course, this is nothing more than a classic cross-site scripting filter, and what could be more inviting to have a look at that? We did, and we were shocked. Because what they used for parsing HTML was pretty much the old sanitizer or the old parser that was created by John E. Resig in 2008 to parse modern HTML in 2015. It's like, what, really, that seven-year-old thing? That is working out for them? But it worked out for them. And they basically went over the HTML string, so like, oh, here's a lesser than, here's something that is a word character, and here's a greater than, that must be HTML, so we have a node now. It's like, okay, interesting. Let's have a look at that. Because we're likely to be able to bypass that, right? So here's the first bypass that uh, Gareth and me more or less co-found in a project that we're doing for Google. So we realized that they permit SVG to be used. And it's like, yay, SVG. And you can see we can use the namespace, and we can use the use element. And the use element is interesting, because the use element allows you to pull resources from the same domain into that SVG and show them as if they were part of the SVG. Only that some browsers don't give a damn about the MIME type. They really don't care. They're like, yeah, Chrome says, like, I don't know, MIME types, MIME types. This is not really interesting here. So I'm just going to accept everything. Oh, everything? That means PDF and application JSON and text CSS? Yep, everything. Whatever is being delivered, doesn't matter what the MIME type is, Chrome will still accept it as a valid SVG that can be used inside another SVG. 
And that's the attack. We again use the animation that is creating like a panel that has a JavaScript URI on top, and we bypass the XSS filter. The only thing that you needed to have would be a possibility to reflect content somewhere on that domain, be it in a JSON callback or a PDF that you upload or whatever. Just had to be some content somewhere with whatever MIME type. Not too spectacular, but they still decided to kind of kill that sanitizer and write their own and new sanitizer. And this time they kind of did it the same way as we do it with DOM Purify or XSS or anti XSS library. And they're using document implementation to create a fresh document that is safe, that cannot leak, that cannot execute JavaScript, that is just the perfect thing to go with. Um, small side note don't trust this thing anymore because Firefox has a bug that gave us an XSS with DOM Purify that we had to patch around and they didn't fix that bug. So don't trust document implementation too much. Um, we can talk about this later on if you're interested in these particular details, but it sucks a lot. And I'm a bit angry at Mozilla here for not fixing them because parser bugs you should always fix. Anyhow, they also made another decision. They said, like, yeah, we're not going to permit SVG anymore because it's too risky. Like, there's these people out there and they have a look at SVG, SVG security and they're just like going to poop over our picnic and that's not nice. So we had a look at that thing and again there was a bypass. This time not related to SVG but again, working in Chrome. It's quite funny to see those bugs in the Google library also work in the Google browser. Uh, it's like a good coupling. But uh, the bug is beautiful because Chrome does a very interesting thing. Imagine a link that looks like a relative URL that contains a Unicode white space at the beginning and then is using a JavaScript URI and then the usual alert. Every filter out there will say like, okay, that is a relative URL. It doesn't use a dangerous protocol because that shouldn't work. And if you just execute that in your page, nothing's going to happen. However, if you then touch the inner HTML property just once, somewhere on that page, document body inner HTML or that elements inner HTML, and write it back to the DOM, then all of a sudden, that Unicode white space disappears. It's just gone. What happens if it disappears? You have a JavaScript URI, you have a bypass. It's like, okay, that is really bad. We filed a bug still unfixed, but it's quite interesting, because there's a bunch of characters that you can use for that. That should be the uh, Ockham uh, vowel separator, and the Mongolian vowel separator, the Occam space mark, a bunch of other spaces. So you can use all these characters, put them into the scheme, and once inner HTML is being accessed, they're gone, and you get your JavaScript URI back. So bypass number two. But as you can see, it is pretty specific, so you don't have a general bypass against these things. And uh, we were like, okay, that's, that sucks, we're attackers. We want to have a general bypass and cause real damage here. How can we get one? We don't find any in the code, so we, we need to be more evil. Let's see when we talk about A4. A3 is the CSP mode. This is beautiful. The CSP mode is quite nice because CSP, as you all know, is one of the silver bullets for web security if you have the possibility to use them. And mostly on complex web applications, you don't. But it's super great for extensions, for packaged apps, for everything where you have an HTML engine, but you cannot risk ever at all that any external script comes in. For that, CSP is absolutely amazing. I think with hundreds of websites that we tested in 2015 with our company, only two had CSP. Two. Just two of them. Amazing. So it tries to be an XSS killer, and once it's actually being deployed, it's quite good in doing so. And one of the mechanisms that CSP is using to kill cross-site scripting is to not allow any inline JavaScript. So you cannot use any eval, you cannot use function constructor, you cannot use script tags that contain the script directly but don't pull it from a trusted resource. You cannot use event handlers, so image on error, body on load, all these things are deactivated. You can't use them anymore because they're gone. The browser oppresses them. So it's like, nope, none of these can be used. Here's an error. It's like, okay, that's interesting. It's particularly interesting because AngularJS brings its own event handlers. It's like, oh, so uh, CSP wouldn't dare to consider them, right? Because that is all like JavaScript logic. They come up with their own attributes, and you can just like inject those attributes instead of the classic on click. So this wouldn't work anymore, but this would work. And they actually state in the documentation, yeah, we have ng-click and it's accepting clicks, or ng-focus that is accepting focus events, and you get like a free dollar event object, and that's the actual native event object, and every native event object in any browser has a property that is called view, and view is window. So that's it. So you bypass CSP. You don't inject that, you simply inject this, and then dollar event view alert one, and done you are. CSP is completely bypassed. Not if just like some stars are aligned, or this is here, or this is there, it's completely bypassed. You have full access to the DOM, full access possibilities to execute inline JavaScript, despite CSP. 
no matter how strong the policy is. Of course, they fixed that. So yeah, this is, this, is, this is not good. You need to fix this. So they also started using the sandbox for the click handlers. We had a closer look at this thing. It was like, oh, what's, uh, well, how, how what? You can use ng minus click. OK, fair enough. You can also use ng colon click. Well, fair enough, who, whoever likes namespaces. You can also use x minus ng minus click if you want to have like experimental attribute names. You can also use data minus ng minus click if you want to have it be HTML5 valid with custom data attributes. But you can also use underscore minus, underscore minus, underscore minus, ng underscore minus, underscore minus, underscore minus click. Because what they do internally is they take that string of that name, of that attribute, and they normalize it. And only if you find, or whenever you find an ng in there, it's like, oh, ng, that's an event handler. Yeah, let me take it, uh, let me turn it into one. It's like, okay, well, that's, that's very generous. So if anyone is ever blocking these, this will also go through, or whatever combination you can come up with. So feel free to just like, play with that thing and that is still present in the latest versions. However, they fixed the direct access to window and uh, made sure that the sandbox is noticing that we're touching window and want to do stuff with this, and uh, of course that kills the attack. And we can't use anything constructor-ish or sandbox bypass that is using function constructor because CSP, right, that would be blocking it. We'd say, like, nope, no eval here. But uh, today's actually quite a special day because this was the theoretical slide. I'm still saying this here, I didn't find the time to update. Um, today I saw that Google's V8 implemented a new feature, and that is the ECMAScript 6 Reflect API. Because with the ECMAScript 6 Reflect API, you get a new bypass for free. Because that allows us to do something that is very, very interesting. Let's have a look at this. We have the ng-click. And inside the ng-click, we say $event, $view, uh, .location, .replace. So we're obviously doing something that replaces location. In CSP, we cannot just simply replace location with the JavaScript URI because that's a violation and wouldn't work. But what we can do is we can use blob URIs because a blob URI can be redirected to, the blob can contain HTML and JavaScript, and the blob in Chrome will execute on the domain but not inherit the CSP headers. So it will be free of CSP. I think they're in the process of fixing that, but uh, you don't have any CSP protection there. Now, we could just go ahead and say, like, yeah, let's just like, use new space blob and fill it with content and redirect there, but we can't do that. Because the AngularJS parser says, like, nope, you can't use the new operator because the new operator is dangerous. You shouldn't touch it. And it's like, oh, how can we create a blob without the new operator? Dang, we can't. Oh, we can, thanks to ECMAScript 6. Because there we have the reflection API, and the reflection API allows us to do something that is equivalent to the new operator, but doesn't use the new operator. So the only thing we have to do here is say dollar event view location replace event view URL create object URL event view reflect construct, and that is identical to calling the new operator reflect construct. And then we throw the blob in and we execute the whole thing. To make a bit more clear how this whole thing works, we have it here step by step, and you have to read it from the bottom to the top. First, we build a blob that fellow here. Then we create that blob and we get around the limitation of not being able to use the new operator, but simply calling for event view reflect construct. Then we take the whole thing that is the ready-made blob, we throw it into create object URL, so we get a blob URI, and then we just redirect to the blob URI, and that's it, CSP bypassed. We have arbitrary JavaScript execution, and it harmonizes with AngularJS expression parser, which is quite nice. How often did we use this in the wild? Not once, because it just came out today. So um, look it up. It's actually in the changelog for uh, V8 of uh, today's or yesterday's changes. So that is quite nice. It's good timing. So of course, they fixed that in AngularJS in the latest versions. And there is no CSP bypasses anymore. Well, there is one left. And that's a really problematic one, because it's pretty much universal. Who here uses a CDN to deploy scripts faster and save on bandwidth? It's okay to be honest. I don't see any hands. Yes, thank you, sir. You deploy a CDN or from a CDN. So we had a look at what the Google CDN is actually deploying. We also found a lot of websites that are pulling scripts from the Google CDN because why not? And if you combine CDN usage with CSP, you have to whitelist that CDN URL. And if you have a look at the tutorials that you can see over at Google, they all pull content from the CDN because it's their freaking CDN, right? I mean, why would they not recommend to use it? So in all CSP-enabled tutorials you will find there, you will always find that particular URL to be whitelisted. 
And that's, of course, a universal bypass that they cannot really fix. Because the only thing that you have to do is find a website with extremely strong CSP, default source self, and that's it. You can't do anything at all. Only trusted domains. And the Ajax Google API site.com, where you pull the content from because it's the CDN and it's cheap and it's nice. Then you realize that you have an injection, but you can't do anything with it because they also use the latest version of AngularJS. Here, 1.4.6 could also be 1.4.8 or 1.5.0 RC1.2 or better, whatever. Works with the latest one. And then the only thing that you have to do is use your injection to simply import an older version of AngularJS to override the newer one and give you the bypasses spec. That's nice. But you might say, no, no, this cannot work. This is not making any sense because you have to lose a race. So you have to lose a race? What? Well, the newer one is bigger because it contains more features. So it might load after the older one. The older one doesn't have so many features. It's like 30 kilobytes less in size, so it's very likely to load faster just to be overwritten by the newer one. So there goes your bypass because the newer one is protected, and if the newer one loads after the older one, you lose the race. Uh, you win the race, actually, and that is bad. You have to lose the race here. You have to load the old one slower than the new one. And that kind of sucks because, I mean, you can kind of provoke that situation and inject like hundreds of script elements and just hope for the best or try to delay it or influence something on the network or do some other, some other shenanigans, but that really sucks. And while I was testing with this, I was realizing that I never had to lose the race to get the bypass. And I was like, why? Why do I not have to lose that race? And then I found out that the developers of AngularJS created a collision bypass, uh, like a collision check. And the collision check in newer version says like, hey, is there some AngularJS already? And if that is so, bye-bye, I'm opting out early. It's like, what? And the older versions don't have it. The newer versions have it, starting with 1.2.15. And that means that you always lose the race because the newer version, even if it loads later and would technically override the older version that you injected, will always back out and say like, ah, 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 I'm so, so summer's already here, so uh, just like do your thing. That is awesome. We had a video conference about that with the Google ISE team. So like, guys, this is unfixable. Like, what are you going to do? And it's so like, yeah, that really sucks. <laughs> they can't remove it on the CDN because then they break the web. They can't just like kind of patch a collision check into the older versions because then they break the web. They could start with collision checks that are a bit smarter in the newer versions and the really new versions to kind of fill that gap. But then you would have protection with the very new versions, but not like the middle range. So there is nothing that they can actually do. And eventually they decided to say, like, yeah, AngularJS 1.2.0 is closed. Whatever. Let's just deal with the risk and accept it. That's cool. Good for a pen tester, bad for the users. So <sighs> A4. That's my favorite one. Because we try to be actual evil and kind of do something that is not OK. And um, before we start hating on me, that was coordinated with Google's security team. I asked them in November of 2014, it's like, guys, we have like a plan, and it's not a nice plan, but we just want to see if that works. And I told them about the plan, and they said, like, you can't do that. That's, that's not good. It's like, come on, please. It's like, all right, do it, but let us know if it works. I don't think it works, but let us know if it works. Like, okay, let's do this. So we wanted to attack the code base. We wanted to get a cross-site scripting into AngularJS without the developers noticing. By kind of tickling a bit here and adjusting a bit here and doing some forum posts here and there, which is like engineering them into having an XSS that we want, that we produced without them noticing. And I mentioned in the very beginning of that talk that there is tons of traction on this project and that not everybody can release and uh, not everybody can review all the code at all times. Like they upgrade all the time, new releases all the time. That cannot be reviewed. It's impossible to review that. So uh, we try to make use of that and turn it into something evil. Of course, we could go the blunt way and say like, yeah, we're just going to create like a fake account on GitHub and do some fake commits here and there and have like some kind of whatever reputation and then just give them like a poisonous PR, like a poisonous pull request, and they maybe don't notice. It's more likely the pull requests are being reviewed before they actually are being committed to the code base. So what we needed was theoretically a bug that exists, that we find, that we can bend in a way so it gives us the cross-site scripting, 
but they wouldn't notice. And it would give us the cross-site scripting upon them fixing the bug and thinking they're doing a good thing. Whereas we just sit there and wait. And uh, the stars were aligned very, very well because that bug existed. Here it is. This is the sanitizer component, and it's specifically the whitelist of permitted attributes and tags that they deem to be okay. They were pulling this information from uh, a wiki that was initially published by the WG. And the WG said, like, yeah, those things are safe. You can use them. That's perfectly fine. No problem at all. Just like completely safe. We knew already that they're not perfectly safe because two attributes in there, attribute name and attribute type, are unsafe and can be abused for cross-site scripting. Those work in the SVG context and allow you to specify an element that has another child element when the child element is then declaratively changing properties of the parent element. So you could take a link and you could animate that link or particular attributes of that link into being from something harmless to an intermediary step to something nasty, for example, a JavaScript URI. Now, we tested that and said, like, hey, we have these two attributes here. That is awesome because we have the XSS already. We can just like, get our bug bounty. And they realized that it doesn't work because there was that particular bug in the AngularJS code base, exactly that one that we wanted. Here it is. When they iterate over tag names and attributes, they, of course, check them against that whitelist. But what they did was, before they checked against the whitelist, to take everything and lowercase it. So whatever was found in the DOM, in the elements that they checked against, was first lowercased. But then if we will have a look at the whitelist again, we see, yeah, that is mixed case, that is camel cased. So this will never be true, even though it's on the whitelist. It's like, nice, that is the exact bug that we need to cause mayhem. And uh, we went to hands like, AngularJS team, hello. Oh, we have like a bug request, like we want to file a bug. We notice that you have like these legitimate attributes in there and they kind of don't arrive because you do this lower casing. Can you fix that? <laughs> they said, yes, we can fix that. So the fix got accepted. And I didn't even hide my identity. I just like did it with the Cure53 account and they should have known because we were in contact before and they should have known when that dude comes and just like files a bug, something fishy is gonna happen here, but they didn't notice and they fixed that bug. I think I filed it in December and it was fixed in mid-January and I was sitting in front of my email client and the mail arrived that, yeah, your bug was fixed. Like, yes, how awesome is that? And I tested it with the latest version. It's like, yes, the XSS was in. It's like, nice, feeling like a thug. So the full bypass looked like this. It was an SVG, a link with a harmless href. Inside there is a circle, which is quite big so you can click something. Then next to the circle, as a parent element, you have an animate, and you say attribute name xlink href. So you're animating the xlink href of this particular link, the parent element. Then you say, hey, we start this whole thing in second zero, or whatever time unit is actual here. And then we say we they animate it from a malicious value to a value that is invalid in XML because it's an ampersand. You can't just have an attribute content that is ampersand. The animator doesn't know that, but XML around it knows it and says, like, okay, I'm trying to animate to an ampersand, but that is not allowed. I have forgotten what was here, so I'm animating back to the from state, which was the JavaScript URI, and thereby gave us the bypass. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't even crazy what happened afterwards, because um, I promised to the Google team that we would tell them right away, and I actually did tell them within one hour after receiving that email testing that it works. It's like, nice. So I told them. It's like, guys, it worked, and uh, you need to fix this right away. Like, contact the AngularJS team. It's like, yeah, can you contact them? It's like, yeah, no, <laughs> rather not. Okay, we're going to do it. So they informed them the very same day. Nothing happened for a week. I pinged them again, saying, hey, the, the bug is still there, and you're now at release candidate two. Yeah, we're going to ping them again. So they waited another week. And I think it was like, a total of four to five weeks where nothing happened. They were close to the release. They already had the beta too. It was like millimeters away from the release when I actually kind of pinged the Google security team again. It's like, you have to kind of address this right now. You're using this feature yourselves for a bunch of websites on something, something, google.com. You need to fix this. And then they put some pressure on the team and then they actually fixed that. And the positive effect was that now they have this huge comment block in there where they know that they got burned. And they tell everybody, so whenever someone attempts to touch this file, 
Two people, at least from the core team, have to watch that. You cannot touch this file ever anymore again because that dude. Thank you. So at least they figured that out. We had a similar quarrel with jQuery, and they were like really angry at us. But the positive outcome was that they actually now, after that, created a security at jQuery.com address. So that was good. I mean, they hate us, but they have something good now. So I can take that. I can live with that. Anyhow. It was not the nicest stunt, and it was not too overly ethical, but we had to try it out because someone else could do this too, and that someone else could maybe not identify the Google team or ask them beforehand or be like a hidden white hat that looks like a black hat. So I think it's a good thing to do these things and to pull these stunts off to create awareness and to kind of let the team know that there is people who want malice and will actually carry it out. And we also got bug bounty for that. <laughs> that was quite nice. So, um, so like, Google team, can I get bug bounty for that? And it's like, oh, yeah, whatever, here's your bug bounty. They didn't feel good with that, and uh, I also didn't feel well with that, but well, we got bug bounty, so deal with that. <laughs> and uh, that was our evaluation of the attack surface that is being created by AngularJS, various components, various parts, and various features, and the team itself for not taking care of what people are doing with bug fixes and pull requests. And I think we can draw a quick conclusion here. I do believe that AngularJS, in fact, extends the attack surface. But if it does, then it's technically the developer's fault. Because if you follow their design principles, piece by piece, step by step, and not do any deviation at all, then you don't have cross-site scripting. It's gone. Like, there is no potential for cross-site scripting anymore. You can also see that a lot of mistakes were done in the early days. And they had to break the API thousands and thousands of times. Well, 92, to be honest. And meanwhile, more things are being done right. And I'm very optimistic for 2.0, where they again learn from many mistakes that they did and do it even better. So it is to be expected that finding cross-site scripting or similar bugs in AngularJS applications is getting harder and harder. And that also holds for different frameworks. So we, as penetration testers, need to be aware of the fact that the old times, where we just simply inject a get parameter, and then hope that everything is going to be alert and stuff, those days are over. They're not going to come back because applications work in different ways. So if you still rely on this pattern to kind of get butter on your bread, rethink, have a look at those frameworks, see how they work internally and how you can abuse them because those old traditional ways will soon be gone, at least in modern applications that you test. I mean, the web still consists of thousands and billions and quintillions of other applications that are still following the older patterns. Either way, developers do have to know about these security pitfalls that AngularJS is presenting. If you do not know what is going on, then you have a problem. There should be a security wiki for that on Google.com. We tried to set up our own wiki, but I realized quickly that the maintenance effort was just like far too high. It's impossible for a single person or even a team of five people to maintain this thing and keep up to date and always have a look at frameworks and point at the security issues and vulnerabilities and weaknesses so developers don't step into them. So eventually I gave up on that. Two years ago I created this thing with JavaScript model view controller OMFG talk and the uh, mustache wiki, but it's too much effort. I can't do it on myself. Another thing that is a problem that many sites are still using older versions, so all, this, so all the things that we saw here apply. And they have a hard time to upgrade because, as mentioned, the API is being broken. Creating a very popular framework that is ever-changing and breaks APIs is not a great idea. Creating a framework that is always compatible is also not a great idea, but I think the balance is not given here and there's like too much breakage and it's too hard for developers to actually upgrade the version. However, the AngularJS team as well as the Google team do a good job. They deliver fair documentation. It could be better. They take care of these issues. They do court audits themselves. They do hand out bug bounty to people who break this thing, even if it's a bit malicious. And uh, the only thing that I'm still missing is that there should be more accessible and well comprehensive developer documentation that is coming from the framework artists themselves and from Google security themselves, teaching people on how to do it better and not to trap into these pitfalls. And, uh, shoot themselves in the foot. Because honestly, whenever we test an AngularJS-based web application of rather decent complexity, we always find at least one interpolation that gives us a sandbox bypass that gives us an XSS. Like, it's not the norm not to find any of these. You know the trick that you can do to easily find out, right? So basically, you take any input, say like double curly opening, 555 minus 444, closing double curlies. If you see 111, you have an XSS. That is all we need. Anyway, 
This is the end of my talk, and I hope it managed to shed some light on the attack surface that is presented by AngularJS, and I hope it also kind of showed you what the risks are and what you can do better as a developer and what you should do as a penetration tester. And uh, of course, I need to say thanks to Gareth Matthijs from Scotland, to Jan Horn, to Matthias Carlsson, to Gabor Molna, David Ross, and Eduardo Vela from the security team at Google to kind of allow me to do this research, to help with sandbox bypasses, to help with inspiration and more input. And uh, yes, that's all I got. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is there any questions? Is there a time for questions? Yes, please. Hi. So uh, during those two weeks that you introduced the bug into AngularJS, how many websites were actually vulnerable? Only those that decided to take a current snapshot of the code base or use a beta or use a release candidate. But all of them were. But that is then your own decision. If you use a non-release, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, you have a risk then. No one called me afterwards and told me, hey, I just got attacked because of that particular stunt. And I still deem the risk of cross-site scripting in most applications to be rather low. Not in all, but in most applications. So I could live with the guilt. Or if there is anything, anyone that got compromised with that particular trick. I could still sleep my sleep off a baby, and that would be good. Yeah, nice but it's a, it's a fair question. Yeah. And keep in mind, it was authorized by the Google team to do that. So, And my intention was to get it fixed as quickly as possible. I contacted them one hour after seeing that, and it was them to take weeks, not me. Hmm. Yes, please. I wanted to know why all the Germans are so evil. I don't know. <laughs> You're referring to Volkswagen? <laughs> Firefox, maybe? What do you use? In this particular situation, I did indeed throw a little bit of monkey poop at Chrome, but you should hear other talks when I talk about other browsers, so Chrome is actually quite great. Now that Honey Boo Boo is finished, what are you going to use the next time? I don't know, I don't know. I'm pretty much done, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Working in furniture or something like this. Anyhow, any more questions? If you have more questions after the talk, just approach me. I'm going to walk around here for quite some time or just write me an email. Actually, uh, Thank you. I came up with oh. a question right away. Um, so two core members of the team has to approve, but would the two core members have caught this? I don't know. And I'm also thinking to become a core member. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> oh. Thank you very much, Mario. You're welcome. Thank you.